But we'll get started there in Genesis chapter 1. I'm just going to read through the whole chapter. <clears throat> what I'm talking about today is what men are made of. What men are made of. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 1, the Bible reads, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the, the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas, and God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth, and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and the fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales, and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping things, and beasts of the earth after his kind, and it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and every thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to every thing that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So what men are made of, what men are made of. We see that starts to unravel itself at the end of Genesis chapter 1. Where in verse 27 he says, and God made, created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. If you were to just look across the page at Genesis 2 and verse 25, it says, And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. All tying together, verse 31 at the end of chapter 1, where it says, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very 
good. God putting his stamp of approval upon his creation. It was very good. And we see that reflected in the man and his wife as they are naked together and not ashamed. As we're reading through this, we see that the image of God is what man was created in. Now, I believe that it has a twofold understanding. First of all, being that the express image of God, which was Jesus Christ, had ten fingers, had ten toes, had two arms, two legs, had one head. That same image was the one that Jesus bore. When he was upon this earth as the express image of God, he wasn't different looking than man. He wasn't, he wasn't something alien to them. In fact, when he was called out in the garden, they had to actually go, Judas had to go and kiss Jesus upon the cheek because he was so regular looking of a man. He looked just like everybody else. He walked and talked just like everybody else to the outward. And so we see that indicative of the image of God that we bear. We bear that same general image. But the other thing that I notice is the triune nature of man. Triune nature of man. We know that there are three that bear record in the earth, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one, through the bare record in heaven, sorry. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And even so, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, in verse 23, the Bible affirms the fact when it says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we see then that there is a spirit, there is a soul, and there is a body in the makeup of man. And the goal is that all would be preserved unto the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see then that all in the beginning of creation were very good, even reflecting, like I said, in the nakedness of the man and the woman, the comfort that they had in that case. There was no shame in them being naked one to another. So right away I'm just going to bring this up, because sometimes pictures help me. And we have here the soul, the body, and the spirit, the makeup of man, the makeup of man. So, I'm not a very good artist, but I'm going to try. <clears throat> the soul being then the mind, the will, and the emotions of man. In other words, everything of you that is not exactly tangible, but that makes up you. Right? The body then being that vessel that we travel about in, right? And the spirit being what I would call that, that eternal breath, the, the, the something else, the something beyond our comprehension that God rests within us. And the reason why I like to show his body is, first of all, it's interesting to note that, that what makes up man in the nervous system reflects very closely to the seed that we, we, we begin at, at least the health things mention us. So this soul, your mind, will, and emotions actually drives the body, just being a simple vessel that goes about and does the bidding of the nervous system in the brain that makes up the spirit then being something separate and something distinct from its all. What I wanted to first talk about, while this is the major makeup according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 of men, what I first wanted to talk about was the original state of men. And you can find that original state in 2, Thessal or 2 Samuel, if you would, 2 Samuel and chapter 12. The original state of men, the original state of men is one of, not of innocence, I would say, but one that uh, does not reflect the same accountability that we presently have. In 2 Samuel, in chapter 12, I'm out of my element here, so 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 9, it says, Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. And if anyone knows that portion of Scripture, what we're talking about is David. He committed adultery with a woman and then arranged for that woman's husband, Uriah, to be destroyed in the process. For the sake of time, I'm going to skip down to verse 20 where the Bible says, And then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Well, that seems like a kind of strange thing to do right after what just happened. But what we missed in the context of scriptures was David spent some time in great mourning and lamentation. Why? Because though his sins became before the prophet and the prophet called him out, David repented of the wickedness that he had done. And God said, basically, because you have repented, I will spare thee. But the child that is conceived within the woman shall die. And so that child was born. And in a matter of uh, time, he became very sick. 
And the Bible says in verse 19 that David saw that his servants were whispering. All this time David's mourning, he's weeping, he's lamenting, he's fasting for this child. And he saw his servants and he says to them, is the child dead? And they said, he is dead. And at this time David gets up, he washes his clothes, and he carries on as if nothing had happened. And then said his servants unto him, 2 Samuel 12, verse 21, then said his servants unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? Thou hast fasted and wept for the child while it is alive. But when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread. And he said, While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, Who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? And then this statement. I shall go to him, but he shall not return unto me. This profound statement there dissolves the idea of baby baptism. It dissolves the idea of a newborn, of an aborted child, being condemned to hell for their original sin. Why? Because this child lived eight days. And the prophet looked to David, and David had the understanding to say the statement, I shall go to him. David, a man's after God's own heart, a man on his way to heaven. I shall go to him, but he shall not return unto me. So David, as a saved man, knew that though the child was dead, he would see him again. And so he felt no need to mourn and to weep as do others, but rather he rejoiced that he would see that young child again in heaven. And so what you see here, basically, in the beginning, in the, in the first comprehension, is that a child, when he is first born is the full thing. He's the full story. He's a man, and he's got the spirit. Mind, body, and spirit. Soul, body, and spirit are all one. And there's this thing here that protects him, and it's called innocence, let's say. What that's protecting him from is this. Turn to Romans chapter 7. This is my scroll. And it says on it, law. Okay? If you turn to Romans chapter 7, you're going to find this explained. Romans chapter 7. In Romans chapter 7, we're going to see what I'm describing here is that the newborn, or the one who is younger, is full body, soul, and spirit. And they're all engaged. There's this innocence, and that is protecting them from the law. Romans chapter 7, beginning in verse 7, says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Yea, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. So therefore, there's something blocking the understanding of the law here. And that's the innocence then of the child. Verse 8 says, But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. So we would have sin here resting with man because like I said even though I'm using this term innocence it, it basically is just indicating there's a guiltlessness there, there's something that's dividing from the law there's a barrier that keeps the child from being in judgment at this case verse 8 says sin taking occasion by the commandment In verse 9 it says for I was alive without the law once but when the commandment came sin revived and I died. So essentially, he was alive without the law once, but then when sin entered in, this protection layer broke down, and sin went from being dead and in a tombstone to being very much alive. And here, sin is dwelling in a house, and where is that house? Well, the Bible says, In me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Verse 17 says, Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me, and that's where sin arrives, and sin thrives, and sin lives, is within the man. And when that happens, that's when essentially man becomes this broken up thing again. Why? Because sin has entered into him. Sin has dwelt in him. And we saw that same thing play out in Genesis chapter 3, if you were to go there, when the serpent comes and he tempts Eve. And then in verse 6 it says, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desired to bake one wise, she took of the fruit and did eat, and gave unto her own husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. So at this point, the law and sin come together, reviving sin dwelling within a man. They be, the man becomes in condemnation 
unto the law. And hence we have the three men now divided up into their parts. So the Bible says that he died. When it entered in, he died. It says very clearly, for when I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. So what died in this case? Does anyone know? Well, we know that we have a soul. And the soul, again, is your mind, will, and emotions. This is the thing that interacts with people. That didn't die because Adam and Eve were still interacting one with another, correct? We have the body. This interacts with the world. Well, they grabbed hold of aprons. They sewed fig leaves. They put those upon themselves. They were still able to use that body to interact with the world. But what died was this last one, and that was the part that interacts with God. And it became dead, the Bible says, in trespasses and sins. And so the makeup of man, the, the what I would call is the default makeup of man, after they pass that portion whereby man is, is not innocent, but under that age of accountability, before they're actually accountable for their sin, sometimes you can gauge it based on a child's comfort for being naked. If anyone was here at church last week, we saw Caleb get up and go, I'm naked, and go running around the auditorium. He is not accountable for his sins yet. If he was to pass away, I believe wholeheartedly that I would see him again in heaven. There is absolutely no qualms about a young child being naked and running around. They love it. They think it's great. But there comes a time, and I don't think it's this precise moment, when they start to cover up. They don't want everyone to see them. They start to go to the bathroom in private. They don't want to be changed in public. There's, there's some sort of understanding that they have of their own nakedness. And if we were to look solely upon a Bible principle, we would say that when sin entered in immediately, right, when sin came and had its dominion within this portion of a man, immediately they saw that they were naked. And that is a great tell. So we see then that what died here was the spirit of man. The Bible says that they are dead in trespasses and sins. If you were to look at Ephesians chapter 4, in verse 18, the Bible says, having the understanding darkened, it says, being alienated from the life of God. And essentially, we even saw that play out in the Garden of Eden, where when man found themselves naked, they were ashamed to even face God. They were alienated from the life of God. Of God, and that's our original or our default, rather, state is what we're talking about. Just, just your general unsaved person. If you were to look in First John, chapter five and verse eleven, the Bible says this. It says, "This life is in His Son. He that hath the Son hath God." He that hath not here, go butcher in there, right? Because I try to write it down. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 11. 1 John 5 and verse 11. This is easier. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. So the life that we're now missing in our spirit because we're dead is very clearly in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. If you were to look continually through this, what would, what would bring somebody that life? We all know it. Look in chapter 5 and verse 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. It says in verse 5, Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? Verse 10, He that believeth in the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he hath not because he believeth not the record that God gave of his son. You can continue on and see John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so it's belief on Christ that would receive to you the life that we are missing because we are spiritually dead in this life before we are saved. John chapter 20 and verse 31 says, But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. So the only way that this thing is going to get back to life, the only way that this thing is going to 
be removed from the place of dead and have the life, have the relationship, the interaction with God is through Jesus Christ. We all know this. We all believe that. John 3 verse 36 says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth upon him. So if you don't have good fellowship with God through his Son, then the wrath of God is upon you. And that's all soul, body, and, and spirit. Those are all subject unto the wrath of God, the whole of the picture. So then we see that the major wall between us and life is this one. Unbelief, right? That's what's separating us from our dead spirit. This is the great thing that you would have between you and a living spirit is that unbelief. But we can't leave it alone there also. We also have this thing interacting with our body and trying to destroy us. It's this. And this is going to be a little umbrella, right? We can call this umbrella the world. The world is constantly tempting your body, constantly driving your body to want things, to crave things, to desire things of the flesh. And that's always going to be there kind of interacting. This is one of the major works then of Satan. So your unbelief is keeping you there. And then the world is trying to block you from what? Well, we know that God recognized this state and God so loves us. We saw that in John 3, 16. So God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. He recognized that we were lost, damned, and in our default state, weren't going anywhere but straight to the pits of hell. And so God left heaven, came to this earth, lived a perfect life that we could not live because he was perfect and was not subject unto this same thing. He went into a body, but these things had no sin in them, right? He went into a body and took upon himself temporarily all of the infirmities and pains and aches and trials and tribulations that the body would undergo, but spiritually we think of the Holy Spirit of God, perfect, pure, right? That was the spirit that was empowering Jesus Christ while he lived. And the soul was of God himself, right? It was Jesus Christ's mind, will, and emotions. The very being, the mind of Christ was indwelling this soul. And that's what interacted with the people. God, well, that's what he was, right? And so the world, yes, while it would come at him with different trials and tribulations, he wasn't subject to it because he was over top of these. He also didn't have to worry about this one, unbelief, right? There was no challenge in that area. And so God came to this earth and praise the Lord, he rose again. Us in our own nature, us in our default state, we are doomed. Enter Jesus Christ who came live the perfect life in this area where we couldn't died the death that we deserved, descended into hell for three days and three nights, rose again triumphantly, and now he sits here, right? At the right hand of God the Father. Right? And so then the provision is made. The Bible says, Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Christ, right? And so if we were then to direct our faith unto, right? The Bible says, look and live, my brother, live. Look to Jesus now and live. Right? We're overcoming the world by looking to the cross of Christ. And when that happens, that saying comes to pass. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. And right? So that life which is in Christ, comes upon a man, and Ephesians chapter 2 comes to fruition, who were dead, and now you're not, right? Alive, alive, by Jesus is alive, alive forevermore, and even so are we in Christ. And so what happens is like what it says, he hath broken down that middle wall of partition between us, right? You're looking over the world. You're overcoming the world. And you no longer believe because your mind, will, and emotion have agreed with the cross of Christ. With your flesh, you have professed the name of Christ. You have believed on and called upon him. And therefore, unbelief is nothing but a little rubble because the walls come broken down. Christians can still stumble in this area, right? 
We can still stumble over unbelief because the wall is still there. It's in shambles. You don't have to worry about it. You can walk around it. You can carefully step over the pit hole, which is unbelief. But for now, everything, spirit, body, and soul are alive unto Christ. Why? Because he made the provision. We're no longer dead in trespasses and sins, but the whole comes to be as a living sacrifice that we can offer unto God. <clears throat> so Ephesians chapter 2, in verse 1, begins by saying, You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, right? And then it says this, Wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom we also had, there's a past tense one again, our conversation, here we go again, in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as were others. So that previous picture was one of a nature that is under the condemnation of God, that was dead in trespasses and sins, and that was the nature that we walked under in times past. That was the default patterns that we walked in in times past. And I love this scripture because it just keeps emphasizing it. In time past, ye were, ye were, ye walked in the lusts of your flesh. But what happens here then is an interesting thing. Now that we're alive, and the Bible will begin to explain this and begin to give us understanding of this, as that plays out, it says, For by grace are ye saved, in verse 8, through faith, right? We put our faith by overcoming, believing on Jesus, who is he that come, overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is Christ. By grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, and lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, that God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And indeed, we should walk in these good works. You can go to Colossians chapter 3. But essentially what happens in the scheme of things here is that this guy, who is your soul, essentially gets a little bit closer to Jesus. And he comes and he inhabits this place in here. And now your soul inhabits the space between the body or the flesh and the spirit. And the Bible describes this as the old man and the new man, right? So that which is flesh is flesh. Remember the teachings of Nic to Nicodemus? That which is flesh is flesh. And that which is spirit is spirit. And if you were to go to Galatians chapter 5, you'd see these two are contrary the one to another. So you cannot do the things that ye would. So what we do is we find ourselves then in the middle of this battle where we have spirit, right? And we have flesh. Our soul... Our mind, will, and our emotions are going to be subject to whichever one we yield to. And I go to Colossians chapter 3 all the time because I just love this portion of Scripture. There's so much here about the crucified, about the rendering yourself dead, about the I am alive unto God life, that if Christians should just memorize one verse and just could live it, I think Colossians chapter 3 might be one of the best ones. It said, if... Ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. So your soul should be always geared, if you are risen with Christ, to focus itself upon Jesus. And we know that Jesus is always in line with that spirit, right? He gave it life. He continues to give it life. He empowers the spirit with life. The spirit of God essentially being this, this beam, let's say, of power going unto your spirit. We know that it actually dwells within it, right? And so when you are looking unto Christ in your walk, right, where is he going to point you to in all situations, right? He is going to lead you to live spiritually. So if you be risen with Christ, think, 
Uh, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above and not on things of the earth, not on things of the world, right? We need to be vertically minded. We need to be constantly looking to Christ, constantly thinking about the rewards that we'll gain in heaven, constantly laying up treasures in heaven. And if we do, and our focus is constantly up here, we'll be happy little Christians, right? We'll be smiling, we'll be rejoicing because we're always being led to do spiritual things and to live in the spirit. But if you're looking over here, the exact opposite is the case. You're going to have your back turned to the spirit. You're not going to be focused above. You're going to be focused on things of this world. And you're going to be more subject to trip over the remnants of the unbelief that you have. Maybe even fall into the condemnation whereby you start to doubt your salvation because you're so focused on living in the body, right? These are the people that get saved. And then at the door, they never do anything spiritually after. And they spend the rest of their life. Yes, they've been bought. Yes, their spirit is quickened. But this is where they spend all of their days. In the world, stumbling with unbelief, just, just constantly in turmoil, because though they are alive, they're, they're carnally minded. Verse 3 says, for ye are dead. And I like this. I underline, ye are dead. Who's dead? Because this is a weird statement. It says, ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. How can something that's dead be alive? Well, it's true, because it says, ye are dead. I highlighted that and said, old man. The old man is dead, right? And your life is hid with Christ in God. Your life is is the spirit giving life. Your life is up there abiding in heaven. We're, we're to set our affections. When Christ, verse 4, who is our life, right up here, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. And it says this, it says, mortify therefore your members. So when it said ye are dead, this is one of those things that you just render. By faith you have to believe it. When I wake up in the morning, I don't believe that I'm dead because I'm breathing, I'm walking and talking and, and, and all that, right? I need to render those things to be true. I need to, by faith, accept the fact that Josh Gander is dead. His life is hid with Christ and God. His life is above. His life is in the heavenlies where my affections ought to be. You need to render yourself. And when you render yourselves to be dead, then verse 5 comes to fruition where it says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Where those members are the body. So even as ye are dead because you're crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live, I live according to the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Even so, that is the truth. You need to every day, moment by moment, die daily. Convince yourself, believe by faith that this is dead. And when you do, you mortify your members, you mortify your body parts, you mortify the flesh that's under the umbrella of the world, distracted from Christ, which is constantly doing what? Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, and that was who? That was the original, not the original state, but that was the default state. The children of disobedience who had unbelief here, who had not overcome the world by coming to Christ. It says, in which ye also walked. And I love that. There's another past tense. Ye also walked sometime when ye lived in them. Right? We all lived in this area. In fact, we were closer to the world than we were ever to that dead spirit. And further away still than of Christ who was constantly calling for us. But now ye also, verse 8, put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth, lie not one to another, seeing ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put off what? The new man, which is renewed after the knowledge, after the image of him that created him. And so when you're looking to Christ, the new man is emboldened, is empowered, and reflects more the image of him that created him. This is what the passage says here. So it says, fornication. Does anyone have a problem with this? Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence. How about this? Anger. How about wrath? How about blasphemy? How about filthy communication? How about all the things that the old man used to do? Wherein ye walked, right? Past tense, this scripture keeps highlighting the fact that that was a past tense experience, right? Put off all these, and how would you do that? Well, verse 12 says, if we're to put off something, we're to put on the other. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, right? This sounds a lot better. 
kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. Now we're expressing the image of Christ. Now we're walking in His glory. Now we're showing the trueness of our life, our eternal life that He has given us to walk in. Forbearing one another. How about that one? Being patient one with another. And oh, look at this one. Forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you are also called in one body, and be thankful. So this is all given. It's a past, a present tense experience, turning from the past putting on the image of the Son of God, putting on Christ every day. How? By setting your affections on things above and not on things upon the earth. You begin to walk even as Christ is. It even says that in verse 13. Even as Christ, right? In every one of these we can say, even as Christ forgave, even as Christ forbear, even as Christ walked in the bond of perfectness, having full charity, if verse 15 comes to pass, when we're looking to Christ and we let that's a passive action, right? It says, let the peace of God rule, right? So now I'm not letting the body rule my decisions. I'm not allowing the body, which is yoked up with this world, dictated by past experience of what it used to do, draw me into what I used to do. But I'm letting the peace of God rule within me and take control. Because that's what ruling is, right? That's being subservient. That's allowing for the rulership, the headship of God to take control of us. And how do we do this? Keep reading. Verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord and whatsoever ye do in word or deed. Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. We give to God ourselves as that living sacrifice, right? It says in Romans, it says, present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, right? Allowing the peace of God to rule. Why? Because I'm in servitude unto him. And when that happens, you put on the characteristics of Christ and you dwell in this. But like the Bible says, it says, that which is flesh is flesh, that which is spirit is spirit, and these two are contrary the one to another, so that you cannot do the things that you would. And if we're to be carnally minded, it is death, right? We're going to constantly be stumbling over unbelief, stumbling in faith, stumbling in, in our works and in our deeds. But if we're spiritually minded, it is life and life everlasting. When we're looking to God, not worrying about this, let God worry about the things you're going to stumble over. Why? Because he's leading you. You've put on Christ. You've put on the image of the Son. And you're letting the word of God dwell in you richly, going in that new song, hymn, spiritual song, whatever gets that spiritual thing going within you. That's what you constantly yield yourself to. And this is how you have success in the Christian life, by recognizing where you stand. In a straight between two, right? You stand in a straight where every day, every moment, every second, every month, every, every whatever, you need to decide, am I going to yield to my body and become fleshly and carnal, or am I going to yield to the spirit, which is the truth? Because this is the true Christian. We walk in the spirit and we shall not fulfill the lust of of the flesh. But this is a conscious decision. Just like we look to Christ to live and have our spirit resurrected, we look to Christ to live and have our spiritual life resurrected. It's a, it's, it's, it's a good thing for us to notice this and to recognize it. I hope the pictures help. They do help me to understand how this Christian life is truly walked by setting your affections on Christ and allowing him to point you to the spirit and empower that spirit to do according to his will in all things.